Hey, how's it going? Isla here and I'd like to give you an update on our project called Wild Earth Firths which is one of our mossy earth hubs based right here in the beautiful Scottish Highlands although I am obviously pretty biased. This project focuses on restoring biogenic or otherwise known as living habitats in the firths around the Black Isle and at the moment we are focusing on uh, two habitat forming species so we have seagrasses and we also have native oysters. Uh, the native oyster side of our work we are working to install a native oyster nursery so a lot of that is paperwork based at the moment but the seagrass side of our work is really kicking off and we have taken on four new team members to help us undertake active seagrass restoration through planting over the next few years so we'd love to introduce you to those guys hey lily hey can you introduce yourself and what are you who are you <laughs> <laughs> to the project <laughs> i'm lily i'm a seasonal seagrass officer so here to help out with the field work and data collection that we're doing. Claire! Hello! So yeah, similar to Lily, I'm just here for the season to help with all the seagrass collection and survey. And yeah, it's going great! Milo! Hello, I'm Milo. Um, I'm here so I'm sort of like heading up the seagrass project here at the Wad first. So I'm organising all the surveying, all the methods, uh, how we're collecting the data, where we're doing that and where we're doing the restoration. Hello, I'm Kat, I'm the community and funding officer. Perfect. So this seagrass planting side of our work is supported by the Scottish Marine Environmental Enhancement Fund managed by Nature Scott. Also as part of that project, with this new team, we have been out undertaking lots of different surveys because it is the peak seagrass growing season at the moment. First off, we have more extent surveys. So for seagrass meadows that we don't really have a good idea of how large they are yet, we've been mapping some more of those. Hi guys, it's uh, Milo here. Um, me and Kat today are off to survey some seagrass beds in Allness Bay at the north shore of the Cromarty Firth. So we've just sort of made our way over this lovely salt marsh. And yeah, today we're going to be mapping the perimeter of this bed. This is sort of to inform our plans for the next six months about where we can potentially take donor material from to restore seagrass in other areas of the Firth. It's also to inform us about the general sort of size of this bed, see what sort of impacts we might have if we do decide to take from it. It's also to try and establish if we can restore any areas in here. So like there's patches of seagrass, not that you can probably see yet, but this is obviously bare as well. So, you know, we're also looking out for opportunities of where we could maybe restore. Um, and this sort of data collection now, just mapping the perimeter is going to inform what sort of effort we need to put in to surveying for potential donor material. So this is sort of the extent of the seagrass here. So this is like where it sort of finishes on this perimeter. We've already started to map this area. It's, um, it's pretty big. It stretches for quite some time. We've only mapped eight hectares but yeah this is sort of the seagrass in the last parts of the water before the tide recedes another part of this survey is trialing using q field which is a plug-in for qgis to collect data in the field uh, as you can see like i'm the blue dot there this is the shape files we've currently collected on this bed so you can see for reference just how big it is in comparison and the area we've got to cover is this whole bay and that's the amount of progress we've made so far, so slow gains, but we're getting there. So you can see if you disturb the sediment, how quick this seagrass recaptures it. It's pretty cool. And yeah, there is the updated shape. So Qfield, so far so good. I think this is going to be really important in us collecting reproductive health data to inform where we get our donor material from and give us an overall view of the whole of the Firths around the Black Isle for the Wilder Firths project. We've also been looking into the general health and reproductive status of some of the meadows that we already have a good understanding of extent wise. This is because obviously if you need to collect plant material to use for planting, be that seed, actual plants or plants with a wee bit of sediment, then you need donor meadows. So this data allows us to identify suitable donor meadow sites. So we've just made a really exciting discovery um, on one of our uh, scoping sites and we can see some Zostronolcoi and it's got some lovely seeds. So this is something that's really hard to observe in the field. We've got tiny little seeds there, something we've not really seen before and it means we've got reproductive multi that we can then use as a donor for restoration. Last but not least, we've been looking at uh, various sites that some of them had seagrass in surveys that we have from 1986 
and some of them seem to have become suitable for seagrass because there's some seagrass growing nearby. So we've been gathering data on those potential restoration sites as well, just so that we have a good amount of information on them to trial some planting at them. So the team have been getting on really well. Not going to lie, survey season can be pretty challenging because we have to work with the tides. So that means some really early mornings, it can mean some later than ideal nights. And we have some long days here in Scotland during summer, thankfully. Despite that, we've all had a really good time and there have been a few laughs, some of which have been caught on camera. Oh, we were doing it earlier and I did it and I was just like, yeah, it's a donkey, 100%. Do you want to try your goose impression again? Oh, gosh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what type of goose is that? Uh, a sad one. A sad one. <laughs> More on yeah, for good luck. Thirteen. Say, like, thirteen. 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 I, I saw three zero. thirteen. I saw three more. I saw three more. Thirteen. Right, I had they're like my favourite kind mm. of square. My these ones, one? these <laughs> ones can burn in hell. <laughs> three. <laughs> three. Three. Thirteen plus three. Can we have one PC clip, Milo? That would be great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing, he's wearing. Um, seeds. You don't have any within. Yeah. Nah. Uh, yeah. So we're counting seeds now, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll finish next year. You missed one. In addition to the surveying to inform future work, we've also been checking out our seeding trials that we undertook earlier in the year. So you can check out our last vlog if you want to hear more about that. So Josie and Kat went along to see how that site is getting along. I'm just done just now at Lettuck on the north side of the Viewley Firth with our new member of staff, Kat. Uh, and we're just down checking on the seeding trials that we did about a month ago now. So we're just walking around the different plots, uh, clearing the algae out of the way. There's a little bit uh, of algae over the plots, so we're just clearing that out the way and looking really closely to see if we can find any small germinated shoots from the seeds. So far we haven't found anything um, and that could possibly be because the sediment, so as you can see it's like really really soft sediment underfoot and we've already found when checking the shoots that are out here the sediment is actually covering them quite a lot so if we did have any small germinated shoots coming up uh, it's quite likely that the sediment's going to be on the top of them as well which could be preventing us from seeing anything uh, and also it could be the case that we haven't had any germination yet so uh, we'll just continue to come back and, and see how things are doing over time. Last but not least I've had a really really cool chat with Bethan from the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks or SPUN about the work that we undertook with them last year. It was really exploratory we just wanted to see if there are any mycorrhizal fungi associated with the seagrasses within our project area and other fungal symbionts so i had a really nice chat with bethan so stick around if you want to see a shortened version of that and if you would like to see our full discussion then please click a link below we'll make that available if you'd rather read about the work than watch our chat then we'll also leave a link to the report that was produced by spun after the work that we did I wondered if you'd be able to give us, for those who don't know, a brief introduction to SPUN. Yeah, so SPUN is a, a non-profit research organisation that was set up to protect and understand um, and map the underground mycorrhizal fungal networks. So for those who don't know, mycorrhizal fungi are the symbionts of plants, so they actually live, they have to live in symbiosis with plant roots and they help plants take up nutrients and water. They help sort of buffer them against really harsh environmental conditions. And in return, plants provide them with carbohydrates. So it's like a nutrient symbiosis. Uh, they're all over the world and they associate with enormous numbers of plant species, actually a majority of plant species. So these mycorrhizal fungi are under our feet all the time. There's just kilometers of their mycelial networks in the soil everywhere. When we were chatting to others in the seagrass restoration space in Scotland, it had been kind of said um, in passing in conversation, um, oh, I wonder whether um, the reason why, for example, seagrass restoration might be more successful close to exist closer to existing meadows, maybe part of that picture is that there might be mycorrhizal fungi present in the sediment in which the seagrass is growing um, or on the plants themselves. In so many ecosystems, we know very little about the fungal biodiversity there. But in particular with seagrasses, they are 
quite difficult to sort of study in terms of their microbiome. Um, the microbiome is, is what we're referring to when we just talk about fungi. And the seagrass microbiome is not particularly well known or well studied, but seagrasses exist in such a harsh, difficult environment, especially the intertidal system, you know, because we were out there in the field and it's so changeable. Sometimes it's underwater, sometimes it's it's not underwater and there's mud everywhere and you know there's you're being exposed to the dry air all of a sudden um so what which fungi are helping seagrasses sort of navigate that really difficult environment is really interesting to us and there's been some work that essentially found that seagrasses don't associate with traditional mycorrhizal fungi or the sort of main groups that we know of and that was ended up being the case that we also found when we were doing this this work together we didn't find any mycorrhizal fungi that are in these main two categories of mycorrhizal fungi that we study we did find many fungal symbionts that operate in the same way as mycorrhizal fungi so these are mm. fungi that live in the roots of seagrasses and help the seagrasses take up nutrients and likely help them exist in this highly, highly salty saline environment with very changeable conditions. So what we know about seagrass fungal symbionts is that it's quite different to the fungal symbioses that you see with land terrestrial plants, but that they do seem to really need or they do seem to be choosing to live in symbioses with fungi. So again, there's clearly something very similar going on to what happens on land in terrestrial systems where plants need to live with fungi to help them take up nutrients. It's just, it looks a little bit different in the seed because it's a very, very different sort of environment. I really would have liked to have been there um, when they first looked through the microscope and actually saw those structures because I bet there were some really excited squeals. <laughs> probably probably <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah perhaps one of the one of the cooler kind of like um outcomes from this is how many undescribed fungi we found when we were out sampling and um, would you like to touch on that briefly yeah and this is so this is really interesting we we were able to essentially what we do is we we identify which fungi are present through dna sequencing like i said and how we do that is by taking those sequences and matching them against databases of known fungi. So you can say, you know, this sequence matches this um, already existing sequence we have in global databases. So that's how we know what that species is because it's the same or very similar sequence. And mm -hmm. what we actually found from this work is a majority, a vast majority of the sequences that we found couldn't be matched to any known species. So we could match them, we could match them as at sort of slightly lower levels. So they were, they we could see that they were similar, but not exactly the same species. And that's still interesting because then you can say, this is probably a related species to that one. So it might be similar in that it might be a symbiont, but we couldn't see that it was exactly that species. So that was a majority of the fungal sequences that we found. They were completely undescribed, so undescribed by science and not in databases of fungal species, which really just highlights mm. how much work sort of needs to be done in this area and um, how how much work also just the fungal community is. You know, we have um, we have so few described fungal species compared to animals and plants. So. There was a really interesting paper that came out last year or a couple of years ago now that found that we have roughly 150,000 fungal species that have been identified to science. Wow. But the estimation is that there's about 2 million out there. And if we keep going at the level of at the rate that we're describing fungal species officially, it's going to take us a, an extreme amount of time to have everything described and catalogued perfectly in the way that we're doing it. So um, that's a much worse situation than, say, plants or animals, where we have a much higher proportion of described species 
um, out of what we know exists. So fungi are um, mm. they're a big unknown in many in many ways, and that's what we were seeing in this in this report as well. Just there's so many unknown species existing in symbioses or not with the seagrasses. I just also want to mention that this side of the work and this project of work that we undertook last year concerning seagrass was supported by the Scottish Government's Nature Restoration Fund, which is managed by Nature Scott. I would like to thank once again Spun uh, for coming over and working with us. Thank you, Bethan. And I hope that we will catch up again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And we had so much fun and we loved working with Mossy Earth. So looking forward to many more conversations in future. So over the next wee while, we will now be going into seagrass seed collection, processing and storage. So you can expect that in our next vlog. If you would like to support Mossy Earth and the projects that we do around the globe, please have a wee look at our website at mossy.earth. Read a little bit more about the other hubs. We work in Indonesia, Ecuador, Portugal, and we also support partners in lots of different places. So if you're interested, please check that out. And I will check in with you guys again soon. Cheers. Bye.